Welcome. We are here to talk about developing compliant transition plans. This was our office hours from December 20th, but that was a snow day. So I am just recording this. All right, so this is the team. I am Jennifer Gleason. Um, before I joined this amazing team almost three years ago now, I was a special education teacher and an ed tech before that. We all were special education teachers, so we really um, prefer the support part of our job to the um, monitoring part of our job. So we are definitely here to support you, whatever you need. So feel free to reach out. This is our contact information. Any questions you have at all, um, reach out. All right, so let's get into it. Compliant transition plans. This is gonna be the absolute basics of what's compliant. So section three on your IEP where you check off um, all of those considerations. That last question is about post-secondary transition, right? Is the child in ninth grade or above? Um, if yes, see that little tiny thing there? If yes, section nine should be completed before completing the remainder of the IEP. This is because the whole IEP should really be feeding those post-secondary goals, right? In high school, what we're really doing is preparing our students to go out into the world. So think of it that way. All right, so the federal regulations require transition plans starting at age 16. Maine goes a little farther and um, requires transition plans no later than ninth grade. So we have to report our data to the federal government as indicator B13. Um, so when we come into your school and look at transition plans, we're only looking at those for children age 16 or above. Um, but you still have to do the transition plans starting in ninth grade, but we're only reporting those age 16. All right, so first thing, advance written notice. The advance written notice needs to have the purpose of the meeting and the child needs to be invited to the meeting. Any meeting where transition is discussed, the child needs to be invited. So check off that post-secondary goals and transition services on your advance written notice. If you're a high school teacher, you might wanna just check it on every single advance written notice, that way you're covered. Um, best practice is to either put the child's name in the salutation or send them their own advance written notice. Um, if they are just in that list of attendees on the second page, that is absolutely fine. That is compliant. You are inviting them. Um, procedural manual talks about this on page 38. At the end of this PowerPoint, there is a link to the procedural manual. If you don't have it, check it out. It's a really, really good document. All right. Agency invited with parents prior written consent. This is we got some guidance about how we were looking at this and we're going to start looking at it a little different because we have a better understanding of what the law says right now. Um, procedural manual talks about this on page 41. Um, in section 9G, you would list any um, agencies or organizations that are likely to be responsible for providing or paying for transition services. Um, the consent form, the parental consent form is on page 47 of the procedural manual. This is a little snip from um, a document provided by the National Secondary Transition Technical Assistance Center. Um, and it just, it, it's the checklist for um, checking your transition plan to see if it's compliant. Um, if you look at the second built bullet there, if, if an agency is likely to be responsible for providing or paying for transition services, you have to ask for consent to invite them and invite them as the school. Um, 
So we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so what if you ask for consent and the parent never sends the form back, right? Because that happens, as we know. You want to hold on to the form, and you can see it says date given or mailed to the parents, and then the date it was received back. So you want to keep this proof that you asked for consent because um, this is directly out of IDEA, this um, little snip on the left here. The public agency must invite a representative of any participating agency that is likely to be responsible for providing or paying for transition services. So you must invite them with parental consent, of course. If you request parental consent and you never get the form back, obviously you can't invite them, but you need to be able to show that you requested parental consent. Parental consent, need, you need to get that before the advance written notice goes out, right? Because you have to include that agency on your advance written notice to invite them. So you need to get consent prior to the advance written notice and you need to get it for every meeting where a transition planning is discussed. It's not a one-time deal, it's every meeting. So what happens if the parents show up with somebody that you didn't know about, right? You didn't know Voc Rehab was gonna be involved. You didn't think they were going to, and the parent shows up with Voc Rehab representative. You are gonna document that very clearly in your written notice. That Basically, you didn't know that they were going to be involved, but the parents brought them. Absolutely fine. Document it very well. But now you know, right? So now you must invite them to every subsequent meeting where transition planning is discussed with parental consent. All right. If you have questions about that because it is a new way of thinking, absolutely reach out. Um, all right, post-secondary goals must be updated annually. That's in the written notice, right? You're checking that box in the written notice and you're putting a statement somewhere. You're gonna talk about that, um, that conversation, right? Minimally, you're gonna put the team reviewed and updated the transition goals. Um, you probably wanna talk about any new transition assessments you did, the student changed their mind about what they wanna do, we've added these services, you know. Um, more information in there, but minimally just a statement that the transition plan was reviewed and updated. The goals are based on age appropriate assessments. And you want to keep doing those assessments. You always want to show movement in your transition plan, right? So keep the past assessments on there and put the year that you do them. Um, if I'm looking at a junior or a senior and the only assessment done was one informal student interview, that's typically not enough. Um, there are some times, you know, where the student is going to work at their parents' business or something and they know that and they're set on that and you don't really have to do a lot of assessments. Um, but most of the time, you want to make sure you have assessments in there every year. Um, the NWEA's eligibility um, evaluations, those are not considered transition assessments, so please don't put them in there. You can obviously put SATs, PSATs, ACUPLACE, or that kind of thing in there if they're going to college, or even if they're not. You can put those results of the transition assessments in Section 4A of the IEP. It's really cool to do that because it really shows that that IEP is geared toward the transition plan. Um, you don't have to put them in there. The only thing that has to be in Section 4A are those eligibility evaluations, but you know you can put anything in there. As you know, you can put NWAs in there and that kind of thing. You can also put your results of your transition assessments in there if you want. Post-secondary goals, there needs to be goals in education, training, and employment. Independent living is optional, but we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, your education, training, and employment goals should align with each other, right? You wouldn't say the student is gonna get training in carpentry and their employment goal is to work in early childhood education because they just don't align. You wanna make sure that they align. Um, 
independent living goal absolutely can be blank, um, but think about it. I mean, really all kids could use some kind of support if they're gonna live independently. You know, do they know how to budget? Do they know how to access their support services? Do they know how to do laundry? Do they know um, how to register a car? Get insurance for a car, get renter's insurance, rent an apartment, sign a lease. Um, all of these things could be addressed um, as an independent living um, goal. So here's an example of a student who wants to go into marketing. Um, the student will attend a four-year college or university to study marketing. The student will work in the field of marketing, so those align. The student will live independently and will access mental health supports in his community with support from his parents. All right, we need, so this is where we have to show alignment between the IEP and those post-secondary goals, right? As we talked about, they really should, the whole IEP really should be um, feeding those post-secondary goals. You do not want to create a standalone transition goal. Um, they're awkward. They're not measurable. They're just weird. Um, if you think about it, really, almost all of your IEP goals are going to be able to feed those transition goals. Um, you can have separate goals aligned to each of their post-secondary goals. You could have one goal that aligns to all of that. It doesn't matter how it works. Just it needs to make sense, right? So we have a couple examples. This is our same student who wants to go into marketing and he has a writing goal, right? If he's gonna go into marketing, he needs to be able to write, it makes sense. If he's gonna go to college, he needs to be able to write, it makes sense, it aligns, right? Um, functional, we have a social work goal, the same student. Um, will use techniques learned during social work se sessions to manage his anxiety, right? Anything you're going to do, this will apply to all post-secondary goals, right? Anything you're going to do, you need to be able to manage your anxiety. Um, so that aligns to um, the education training, employment, and independent living. All right, course of study, section 9E. This needs to go through exit, multi-year through exit. Um, you don't have to keep past years on there, but um, you probably want to um, because of the next thing. It, these need to be directly linked to post-secondary goals, right? So you can see the student has introduction to business, independent study, intro to marketing. You want to make sure you can align to each of those post-secondary goals. Um, there's a health class that would align to um, the independent living goal. Because you need to plan this course of study through exit, you need to start those conversations early. How long is the student gonna be in high school? Are they gonna graduate in four years? Are they gonna need a fifth or possibly sixth year? You can always change your mind. The team can always change their mind. That's why we're reviewing this each year. But those conversations need to start right in ninth grade. How long is the student? How long do we expect this student to be in high school? Um, just, some thoughts about course of study. Um, it needs to be tailored to the student, right? And um, support those post-secondary goals. You have to keep the current year through exit. Guidance is to keep all the years. Um, please don't write just the word electives. Document those courses because those are probably the ones that are going to align best to their post-secondary goals. Um, yes, they're going to change your mind, their mind. You're going to update this every year. Um, so those electives can absolutely change, but you need to plan for what they're currently thinking of doing. Um, it's okay to amend as you go through. Um, and be specific, specific courses. Don't just put they will 
you know, get enough credits to graduate or whatever. Um, and this is a snip from that document, that checklist. Um, do the transition services include course of study that will reasonably enable the student to meet his or her post-secondary goals? So it really needs to be aligned. All right, section 9F. These are services and activities provided by adults that will enable the student to make progress toward their annual and post-secondary goals. So think of this as like the service grid, section seven of your IEP, right? These are the services that we are gonna provide that, that is gonna help the child move toward those post-secondary goals, right? So you have, we, we highly recommend a bulleted list all over the IEP. We love a bulleted list. Um, so you can see the first section has their coursework, right? Their education, instruction, and related services are in there. Um, what do we have? Registered to vote, internship, uh, Boy Scouts, volunteer at animal shelter, primary caregiver for family dog, right? All of these things are in there. Um, here, you do not move forward. You put the services that are going to be provided for the life of this IEP, right? So for this year, um, this one keeps the older services, which is nice because again, it shows movement and just puts the year in parentheses. So we know that those aren't happening anymore, but they did happen in the past. So again, services and activities that occur during the life of the IEP provided by the adults intended to help the student move toward their post-secondary goals or sometimes figure out what they wanna do. Um, and you wanna show movement from previous years. Um, and you do not want to include those future services or activities. Section 10, age of majority. So um, if the child is going to turn 17 during the duration of the IEP, then you have to inform the child and the parents of what's going to happen when they reach 18, right? All of those rights move from the parent to the student at age 18. Um, and you need to inform them of that at the IEP meeting the year that they are going to turn 17. Um, and that is in the procedural manual on page 42 for more information. Just some general thoughts. Transition plans obviously should be student-centered, right? Um, family engagement, super important. Assessment, do those assessments. Have the student do those assessments to help them um, figure out what they want to do and what they're able to do. Students must be invited and encouraged to attend and participate in their meetings. Um, and the outside agencies must also be invited to be part of the IEP team. We have a few frequently asked questions. Um, what if you get a new ninth grader in and their annual is in September? You do not know this kid. How are you supposed to write a transition plan for them? You don't have to in September, right? It has to be during that ninth grade year, they have to have, get a transition plan. So you can schedule a meeting later in the school year, right? That gives you time to do those transition assessments, get to know the student um, and have a separate transition meeting sometime later in the school year. What if the child wants to be a rock star or a TikTok influencer? Um, you're gonna help them do some research, right? What does that mean? What, is, what skills do they need to be able to do that, right? How, what does it look like? What, what does it really look like behind the scenes? And um, help them figure out what they need to do and how hard it's going to be for them. And then you can also look at kind of adjacent jobs, right? If the student wants to be a veterinarian, but they're not going to be able to do all that schooling, um, they look into, right, help them look into veterinarian, help them look into what they need to do to get there. Um, and also maybe have them visit a vet's office, maybe have them do some job shadowing. Maybe they can be um, a vet tech, 
or an assistant or something like that, right? But you're going to, you're not just going to come out and say, well, you can't do that. You're going to help them research and come to that decision themselves. Um, don't list specific colleges or businesses because you can't guarantee that they'll get in. Um, again, the, the exception is if the student is going to be working at their parents' business, which we see pretty often. What if the parents don't want to encourage the child to seek employment? Um, there are, we're going to have some resources to help you talk to families and um, help them understand how important post-secondary planning is. Um, in our long B13 training, we talk about a lot about a meaningful day. Um, and it's important for all of us to have a meaningful day, right? And what does that mean? So check that one out if you're interested. We have some resources. These links should work in the PDF right below. Um, this is the procedural manual. Again, all things special education required forms are in here. It's a really, really good resource. Our main special ed regulations. This is all from our website, our PD calendar. Um, the link that you went to to watch this recording probably is the second one. Um, law and regulation, general resources, forms are all on our website. Um, Titus O'Rourke and Leora Byrus do a, I believe it's weekly, um, power hour on Tuesdays. Um, and they really talk about things beyond compliance, right? They talk about that programming and what does a good transition plan look like um, beyond compliance. So they can answer a lot of your questions around that kind of thing. Um, Intact, really great organization. Um, you have to sign up um, to get some of the stuff on their website, but it's absolutely free and it's really good information. Um, Wisconsin has a lot of self-advocacy resources. Um, Project 10, Indicator 13 Toolkit, that's what, so this is what we've been talking about now, compliance and what we have to report. 207, which is the Office of Special Education Programming. Um, this is part of that toolkit. Um, this is our website. Under the professional learning page, there's a separate section for transition planning that has our compliance stuff, and it also has Titus and Leora's um, power hours and um, programming kind of things. This is a link to a document that has a whole bunch of transition assessments and resources, very handy. Another quick book of transition assessments. The pretty new Transition Main website, All Things Transition, really awesome. We have some checklists. This is the checklist we went over today. Um, this is a link to the checklist from um, that national transition committee um, that talks about each component of that B13 indicator. So there's a link to that. Um, this is our professional development schedule for the 23 24 school year. We do have a big B13 training. We just had one in January, but we have another one May 2nd and the registration links are right here. Um, we have trainings coming up that if you would like to share with the, your gen ed teachers, we had one in um, October about discipline and manifestation determination. There's that link is to that recording. In April, we're having really general special ed law for gen ed teachers. If you want to share that registration link with your gen ed partners, that would be awesome. And we always love having related service providers, but two that are really um, relevant are 
coming up next week is writing measurable functional goals and avoiding outcomes. And then in May, we have consultation and related service goals. So we love your feedback. Um, you can use this QR code or link to fill out a feedback form and you will get a contact hour for watching this. Um, but really be honest in your feedback. We do change up our um, PD and how we do it based on your feedback. We also look for what um, subjects you're interested in getting PD on. So again, feel free to contact us anytime with any question, big or small. We are definitely here to support you, and we really think of ourselves as one big team. So thanks again for watching. Don't forget to do the feedback form and get your contact hour.